Brethren, I have a question for you today. That is, are you a perfectionist? Are you a perfectionist? Many people do suffer from one degree of perfectionism or another. And frankly, it damages their ability to move forward in life. It affects their relationships. It affects how they see themselves. It affects their relationship with God. I have to admit, I was a bit of a perfectionist growing up. When I was a boy, I don't know, I was 8 or 10, and I would remember hearing about uh, setting goals, and you should have short-term goals, long-term goals, and medium-range goals. And the short-term and long-term, I could understand. You know, short-term, do so many push-ups a day, uh, practice my trombone, my accordion. We all played accordion. And, um, you know, do your homework, those sort of things. The long term I could understand as well, make it into God's kingdom. That's my long term goal. Uh, Have a family, be married, and and have a successful career, that sort of thing. But the short term was a little confusing. I knew I should have spiritual goals, but I think my execution was lacking, uh, such as in five years I want to overcome pride or greed or selfishness in five years, you know, as a 10 year old. Needless to say, I did not overcome pride and greed and selfishness by 15. Uh, I'm still working on those even now. You know, the hard part is sometimes even in God's church, some of us believe that God expects us to be perfectionists. That that's what he wants. It's not just something that we cook up in our heads, but that's what he is expecting. And um, we keep God's laws. We're serious about keeping God's laws, which, by the way, the world say that's our, that's our problem. They will say that's why sometimes we might struggle with perfectionism, because we're trying to keep the law. And they say the law is done away. You're just making yourself feel guilty. And, you know, we'd all just be more comfortable and happy, and things would be great if we just got rid of the law. We know that's not true. And we can see it in the world. I mean, how's it going in this world? How's it going in a, in a world, let's say the mainstream Christian world, that at some point in time, many centuries ago, frankly, the decision was made that that's a better way to live. We don't have to really keep God's law. We are reaping the consequences today. Our world going crazy. So it's not law keeping that is the problem. So if it's not, what is the problem? Let's explore that today. If you'd like a title, it is, Does God Require Perfectionism? Does God Require Perfectionism. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48 to start off. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. I think a very familiar scripture that as we go there, you'll see where I'm going here. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was talking about a lot of different things, very deep spiritual things, and he came To verse 48, he said, Therefore you shall be perfect, period. There it is, plain as day. That's our our goal, right? That's our destiny. That is our uh, job. That is what's required to be perfect. And we can misunderstand that. Let's look a little deeper. When we talk about the word perfect, we might think, in our modern usage as being without a mistake, uh, being 100% on a test. That's a perfect grade, right? You didn't make any mistakes. Is God saying that his standard that pleases him in life is us for not make, not making any mistakes? Well, hold your place there just for a moment, and let's turn over to Matthew 25 and verse 
24 very quickly because we have an example here I think that that answers that question very quickly and profoundly the parable of the talents you know how these servants were given a certain amount of talents their lord their master went away they were to be working they were to be doing something and the first two when he came back they had done something with their talents right the investment the money he had given them verse 24 what about the one who had received one talent then he who had received the one talent came and said lord i knew you to be a hard man reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed and i was afraid and i went and hid your talent in the ground and look there it is you have what is yours and of course we know the story that the end is the master was furious with him because he had not taken the time to use the investment for something positive. And yet he had not made any mistakes. Maybe he was more fearful of making a mistake than of actually going out and doing something with it. And the master was not pleased at all. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. So it's not about not making mistakes. That is not the goal that God has for us in life as the highest standard we could achieve. Clearly there's something else. Back in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Let's pick it up again. We sit, we read, Therefore you shall be perfect. And let's keep reading. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So what does this mean? word perfect mean let's look at talk a little bit about the greek word and this is probably not unfamiliar to many of you but it's interesting when you look at the actual greek word uh, teleos it means primarily from the international standard bible dictionary having reached the end the term the limit complete full perfect tele we are familiar with television, uh, teleprompter, telescope, teleconference. It means to look to, it means something afar, right? It look, the end, the, the, the finish line, something complete. And so this word perfect is not just about avoiding mistakes. It's talking about reaching an end point, crossing a finish line. What about the Old Testament? The word perfect shows up there too, and uh, certainly the Old Testament is a lot harsher and, and mean and uh, heavy-handed, right? So, so sur surely the requirement in the Old Testament was, yeah, to not make mistakes, right? Well, just you can jot in your notes if you'd like. Genesis 6 verse 9 says, Noah was a just man and perfect. Guess what that Hebrew word means? It's the Hebrew word tamim, and it means complete, just like teleos. Well, certainly there are other uh, words translated perfect, and yes, there is. There's another Hebrew word uh, that is uh, shalem, and in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 61, it says, let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. If you have the new King James, you might see that they change it to loyal. Let your heart be loyal. This word as well, translated in the English Bible in the King James, perfect, means complete. Or faithful, loyal, as it was translated, finished. Whole, wholly devoted to God. So the Greek word teleos, two Hebrew words that are all translated perfect mean whole, complete, the finish line. What about the English word perfect itself? It comes from, through the French, from a Latin verb perfecir, meaning to finish. Isn't that interesting? The way we use perfect today it's, it's, the common usage is without mistake. But the original 
definition and usage of the word perfect in English was coming from a Latin verb to finish. So from every direction, we find the words do not mean what we can take them to mean. So let's go back to Matthew 5 and verse 48. You're still there. Uh, Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, isn't it interesting that in the rest of the verse, it actually shows us the context of that word complete, the finish line. Because it says, be perfect, be complete, be fully grown, be mature, just as your father is perfect. So he's saying, look, there is the end point. You want to be like God. A very, very different meaning and and sense than we have of the word perfect today. And it has big consequences. Mr. Herbert Armstrong wrote uh, years ago in the book, uh, The Missing Dimension in Sex, Uh, talks about the the parallels between spiritual life and physical life. Let me just read a little bit from page 52. He says, All human life comes from a tiny egg called an ovum produced inside the human mother. The sperm cell produced in the body of the human father on entering the ovum finds its way to and joins with the nucleus of the ovum. This imparts life, physical human life, to the ovum. But it is not yet a born human being. Human life has merely been begotten. For the first four months, it's called an embryo. After that, until birth, it's called a fetus. Once begotten, it must be fed and nourished by physical food from the ground through the mother. As it grows, the physical organs and characteristics gradually are formed. Soon a spinal column forms, a heart forms, and begins to beat. Other internal organs form. Why why is this important? Page 55, as the human sperm cell is the very smallest of all human cells, even so, many newly begotten Christians start out with a very small measure of God's Holy Spirit. Many may still be at first about 99.44% carnal. I love that, uh, his statistic, you know. So to uh, one of our uh, young ladies who was baptized this past week, I'm sorry, Uh, You're still 99.44% carnal, uh, or give or take, you know. Uh, Going on, verse, uh, verse, page 57. As the physical fetus must grow physically large enough to be born, so the begotten Christian must grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. He must overcome, must develop in spiritual character during this life in order to be born into the kingdom of God. As the And as the physical fetus gradually, one by one, develops the physical organs, features, and characteristics, even so the begotten Christian must gradually, continually develop the spiritual character, love, faith, patience, gentleness, temperance. He must live by and be a doer of the word of God. He must develop the divine character. What was Mr. Armstrong saying? He was saying that an embryo doesn't immediately look like a human being at conception, right? The two cells come together. uh, They join into the the union of the two cells, and there's there's one fertilized cell, and that divides. And those cells divide, and they continue to divide. But at first, they just look like a bundle of cells. They don't look like a human being at first. It will but not yet. So it is with newly begotten Christians, as Mr. Armstrong was explaining. They don't immediately look like their spiritual father at baptism. You know, think about this for a moment. When you are baptized, you are pure at that moment. You are sinless at that moment. You are innocent at that moment. No sin on your account, but you're not yet perfect. Perfection doesn't just mean sinless. Perfection means full grown. A huge difference. Huge difference. Otherwise, we'd be perfect right at baptism, and then we'd be ready to be changed into spirit and in God's family forever. 
But that's not the plan. So let's go back to uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. We are going to move on from this verse eventually, don't worry. Um, we read, therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So we're, he's pointing us to God, to be like God. And interestingly enough, if you back up a few verses, verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Because he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. In other words, be like God. That's our, that's our destiny. That's our goal, to be complete. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. So very, very different than, than perfectionism. And yet we can sometimes get these things mixed up and put undue pressure on ourselves that really is not productive and not fruitful and doesn't help us get to our goal. Ephesians 4 and verse 13. Why do we have the church? As Mr. Armstrong explained, the, the church feeds us uh, like an embryo. We grow, and that's what we find here. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12 for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man. There it is. We're supposed to be perfect, right? No mistakes at all. Or is it a little different? It's the same word as Matthew 5. To a fully grown, fully developed, mature complete man. And notice, it's not in measure against ourselves, one another. It's not that, well, if, if I'm growing more than you, that's the goal. No. He says, measure ourselves against the standard, and that is Christ. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth and love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So we are to grow to be like our father, and we are to grow to be like our elder brother, Jesus Christ. That's what perfection means. That's where we're going. Let's turn over to... Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Here's another uh, reference here. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And, and sometimes can't we sort of establish our own measure, our own imagination of righteousness, and then that's what we strive to attain to, and it's not what God expects at all. Notice verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. It's interesting how the, the mainstream Christian world gets this verse wildly wrong, misinterpreting it as if Christ is the end of the law, meaning once Christ came, then you do away with the law. It's not what it means at all. It's not what it says because this word, interestingly enough, end is the same word, teleos. The goal, 
the, the completeness, the finish line. In other words, the law, we don't do away with the law because it leads us, it teaches us how to be like God. It teaches us how to be like our father, and it teaches us how to be like our elder brother. So, thinking about perfectionism, who struggles with perfectionism? You don't have to raise your hand, don't worry. That's not what I meant. You know, sometimes we can think it's only teenagers, young people, and many of them do, but it can be older people too. You know, some of our older brethren have have sometimes express express, uh, doubts. Am I pleasing God? Am I making him happy? And am I going to be in his kingdom? You know, they're keeping God's laws, they're walking this way of life, but they struggle, they have guilt. Sometimes in their 70s or 80s, it can affect people of any age. If that's you, this message is for you. Maybe they feel guilty that they can't do some of the things they used to be able to do when they were younger. But it's a season of life. Things change, don't they? Physically, stamina, energy, strength. Unrealistic expectations can lead to a feeling of disappointment and perfectionism and discouragement. What about our ladies? Sometimes homemakers, wives, mothers uh, can think that they have to be the perfect homemaker, the perfect wife, or the perfect mother. And they've got to do everything at 100% at all times. And they feel guilty if... They don't do everything perfectly in running a household. But life happens, doesn't it? Someone falls down, makes a mess, has a tantrum, and your big plans come to a screeching halt. Right, ladies? It's not always perfect. And it can lead to guilt. If that's you, this message is for you. Others, our single ladies, they can be racked with guilt. They can feel like, well, I don't have the responsibility of children in my life or a husband taking care of a family, but I still don't do things perfectly. And I feel guilty sometimes. Am I really pleasing God? Men can be overwhelmed and perfectionistic. We can sometimes expect too much from from our mates if we're married. We can be too critical and and cranky. Uh, In our responsibilities, we can worry and fret in our jobs and even become workaholics because of perfectionism. So it it can really apply to a lot of us. Now, don't get me wrong. In in speaking of this, um, it is important to have high standards and, and strive for excellence. And I wouldn't want anyone to misunderstand this message in that way. Um, I'm very thankful every time I drive over a bridge that somewhere back at some point in time an engineer got really good grades in college and was trained to build that bridge. Uh, speaking of bridges, or not bridges, I, I'm, speaking of crowns, I'm, I'm going to have a crown in a couple of months at the dentist's office, and I'm really glad that the dentist I have did well in school, Right? I'm not very confident if I go into that chair thinking, well, they did good enough. There are some commercials like that, right? Good enough is not good enough. Uh, at, at the office, you know, we work in festival and CAD and work with legal on contracts. And you've got to have attention to detail and, and be accurate. Otherwise, you make big mistakes. And Mr. Weston is prodding us all in the office to look at our processes and look at ways to improve how we serve the church, how we serve our subscribers and and the members. And that's all important. None, None of that, nothing that I'm saying should take away from any of that. Please understand. What I am saying is sometimes our misunderstanding of how to get to that striving for excellence can really wind up sending us down the wrong path and hurting ourselves. What about our teenagers and and young adults? There's been a lot written about the pressures on young people today. 
There are unique pressures that were not there when many of us were that age. Uh, Sure, there's always been peer pressure and social pressure, but the Internet has, and the online experience, really has taken it to a whole different level. And it creates an unreal world that they can get sucked into and create a lot of problems because of the sense of perfectionism they have to attain to. Let me just read a, a little bit of an article from Adelaide, Australia, April 3rd, 2020. Uh, entitled Self-Esteem and Sleep, Need for Perfection, Negative Thoughts Keep Teens Awake at Night. The years between 12 and 20 are a period of self-discovery and self-doubt for the average teen. It's hard not to compare oneself to others in high school, especially in today's day and age of Instagram and selfies. Now, a new study conducted at Flinders University finds that teenagers experience insomnia, insomnia, most often due to persistent negative thoughts and a need to achieve perfection. Making matters worse is the fact that a lack of sleep usually contributes to depression and anxiety symptoms, creating a vicious cycle of comparison and negativity. Close to 400 adolescents between the ages of 14 and 20 took part in this online study, and researchers say their findings validate the theory that there is a link between constant negative thoughts in trouble falling asleep. Perfectionism was found to make this phenomenon even worse. So as parents, we need to do all we can to help our children navigate through this world and understand the world. You know, our our girls may logically and intellectually understand that the pictures and the highlights of, of influencers and YouTubers right, and, and posters on the different platforms, um, or even my friends. I know their lives really aren't perfect, but all the pictures present them at their best moment, at their funniest moment, at their cutest moment, the best images of their life that week, right? And even though I know intellectually that, okay, that is the best moment, when I'm flooding my mind with constant images of everybody else's best moment, I can't stop but thinking at some point, what's wrong with me? There is something that happens inside then that causes us to think there's something wrong. You know, frankly, Brethren, we have such a huge advantage in the church compared to the world at large because we have a strong sense of community and fellowship and coming together like this, like we're doing right now, fellowshipping before, fellowshipping afterwards, and our young people all are involved in that as well. And they have to face and learn the awkward moments of of face-to-face communication. And sometimes they are awkward, aren't they? Sometimes relationships are messy when they're face-to-face and in person. And that's good because that's real life. And that helps us grow. Unlike the, the world of unreality that the online experiences gives and frankly contributes to anxiety and and depression and all all those things. What What a huge advantage that we are a part of a group that comes together as a family every single week and in congregations around the world. There was a book written back in the 1920s by Woodrow Wilson, former uh, the president uh, back back in the in the 20s. I came across it in in college. Really struck me. It was powerful. I'd like to share some of it with you. It's entitled "When a Man Comes to Himself." Directed toward young men, but you can certainly uh, apply it to young women as well. He writes, "It is a very wholesome and regenerating change when a man undergoes when he comes to himself. He comes to himself after experiences of which he alone may be aware, when he has left off being wholly preoccupied with his own powers and interests and with every petty plan that centers in himself. 
There is no fixed time in a man's life at which he comes to himself, and some men never come to themselves at all. I think we can relate to that today, can't we? We have a lot of people who are physically grown out there in the world who are acting like children, insulting one another, government leaders, entertainment celebrities, media personnel who are not acting like grown-ups. I think that's what you know, Woodrow Wilson is saying, and, and frankly, so powerful for our generation in light of thinking about what does God want from us? Not just sinlessness, yes, that too, but he wants us to grow up. He wants us to be fully mature and complete like him, like Christ. Going on, Woodrow Wilson says, No doubt to most men it comes by slow process of experience, at each stage of life a little. When a man comes to himself, he understands what capacity is and what it is meant for, sees that his training was not for ornament or personal gratification, but to teach him how to use himself and develop faculties worth using. A man who lives only for himself has not begun to live, has yet to learn his use, and his real pleasure, too, in the world. It is not necessary he should marry to find himself out, but it is necessary he should love. Men have come to themselves serving their mothers with an unselfish devotion, or their sisters, or a cause for whose sake they forsook ease and left off thinking of themselves. It is unselfish action growing slowly into the high habit of devotion that teaches a man the wide meaning of his life, and makes of him a steady professional in living, if the motive be not necessity, but love. Christianity gave us, in the fullness of time, the perfect image of right living. Certainly he doesn't have the, the whole picture of what true Christianity is, but, but he had a concept of a, a way of life, and he describes it. He says, the perfect image of right living, the secret of social and of individual well-being. For the two are not separable. And the man who receives and verifies that secret in his own living has discovered not only the best and only way to serve the world, but also the one happy way to satisfy himself. Then indeed has he come to himself. Experience mellows and strengthens and makes more fit. In old age brings satisfaction, not regret, but higher hope and serene maturity. When a man comes to himself, or a woman comes to himself, herself, in other words, understands why they're here. And brethren, we, we have such a bigger picture than even he was talking about, don't we? We really do understand that we are becoming like God and like our elder brother. And that is our destiny. There are so many passages that talk about perfection and becoming perfect. And it's a fascinating study to go through it. But let's jump to a little bit of some practical examples. So if we compare and contrast two mindsets, one of perfectionism and one of a, a growth-oriented mindset, what are the differences? Number one, number one, perfectionism looks to immediate results. A growth mindset looks to long-term success. Perfectionism looks to immediate results. Growth mindset looks to long-term success. You know, sometimes we're struggling with something we need to change, we need to be better, and we can get overly focused on the results right now. And we may fall for the lie of perfectionism that we need to change everything immediately. What if, what if a person, uh, you know, hadn't exercised for six months, zero exercise, and said, you know, it's time to get on a program, right? Right? So you exercise one day. Does that immediately transform the person out of a sedentary, uh, you know, chair sitter into totally fit? Of course not. We wouldn't assume it. It takes time, doesn't it? 
So why is it sometimes that we expect that kind of instant change within ourselves? I remember when I was a teenager, I, I played basketball. I had big hands, so I could palm a basketball, and that was, that was fun. The problem was I couldn't jump. And I always wanted to dunk a basketball. So I worked on my jump, and I did exercises, and I researched how do you increase your jump. And I found a great, great book and really fascinating uh, 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 theory and, and concept of how you grow in improving your jump. And what they said was you, you mark a place on the wall. Make sure your mother is okay with that. But you mark a place on the wall, and you jump as high as you can. You mark that spot, and then you wait two weeks. And every day during that two weeks, you do your exercises. And then two weeks later, then you test yourself, and you see if you can hit that mark or more. And the temptation is you want to test yourself every day, right? Right? But they said, don't do it, because day to day you're not going to see growth. In fact, you might even see regression. You might one day be worse than the, the, for the day before, and the next day you might be worse than both days. But if you're doing your exercises, eventually you're going to see growth. And I thought, wow, what a powerful example. I never got to dunk a basketball, but I thought it was a great, great concept, and I've learned a lot from it. Uh, Mr. Wallace Smith this week gave the Bible study. He talked about how God is into the long game, isn't he? God is looking long term, like a farmer. You know, uh, as a farmer, you've got to plan ahead. You've got to prepare your field. You've got to acquire the seed. You've got to sow the seed. Thinking about a farmer, how much they have to look ahead and see the long view. There is no instant success in that line of work. They put the seed in the ground, and then they wait. They wait. And there's growth even when you don't see anything happening, isn't there? It's interesting that we, when we think about the ancient Israel, in ancient Israel, the growing seasons in the Middle East, uh, the barley was sown in November and December, and then the rains came. And so right now, at this point in time, we, we, we think of as the winter, nothing growing, at least up north. But over there, November, December, January, February is a growing season. And what was planted in November and December, the, the heavy rains come, and it grows slowly and eventually is harvested around the spring holy days. So right now, we are in the growing season, if you think about it. Mr. Hernandez had a sermon some years ago about that. The early rain and planting season. Speaking of this time as well. It's not just winter. It's a growing season. And we are in a growing season. Let's turn over to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. 1 John 3 and verse 7. Even sometimes when we can't see the growth, it's imperceptible. Have you ever sat down and watched a tree grow? And how long do you have to sit there to figure out, you know, nothing's going to change in front of me. But then you walk away, you get about your business, you do other things, you get busy, and... Three years goes by, and you look at that tree again, and you think, wow, how did it happen? It was growing all the time. We just couldn't see it. That is the way our lives are, too. First John 3 and verse 7, it says, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is Righteous. So we are here to walk through our paces, to practice righteousness, to work towards being like God and striving to be like God more and more every day, not expecting instant perfection, not a, not a license to do evil. I think we all understand that. But not expecting instant perfection, which can discourage us. And that leads to the next point. Number two. Perfectionism is easily discouraged. A growth mindset is resilient. 
Perfectionism is easily discouraged. A growth mindset is resilient. You know, when we're in a growth mindset, mistakes or correction don't hurt as much as if we're in a perfectionism mindset. When we're in that mindset, mistakes or correction can crush us can make us lash out, can make us angry. We don't even know why we're angry. But if we're so shocked and horrified and disappointed when we make a mistake, we're forgetting we're human. We're forgetting what this process is all about, and maybe we're getting too much of a perfectionist thought in our mind and even feeling the need to project that as an image you know, to others. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, notice 1 John 4 and verse 17 says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Love is perfected in us. And the more we have God's mindset, the more we have complete Love. That's what perfect love is. It's complete love. It's his love. It's full, mature love. It's full-grown love. And the more we have that, the less fearful we're going to be about the future. If we're following God and walking with God, and we stumble, we fall down, we repent, we get back up, we keep going, and God is pleased with us, and we can be confident. Going on, he says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Again, what does this mean to be made perfect in love? Well, it's not our love. That's the point. It's not sort of trying to attain to some sort of love that we just work up. It's God's love. It's looking at the end game. It's seeing who we're trying to become like, our father and our elder brother, and it's asking them to put their love in us. And the more we have that, the more we are not afraid. You know, think about Spokesman Club. Uh, speaking is, can be very intimidating. I think it's one of the highest uh, fears on many surveys that come out uh, for people. And yet, if a speaker in Spokesman Club is saying, okay, I'm here, it's terrifying, uh, just like up here, you know, it's terrifying, but I'm here to serve whoever is listening. I'm here to give them something. And maybe in Spokesman Club, maybe it's, you know, how to change a tire, or how to fold a, uh, a suit, or how to whatever. Uh, whatever the topic is, but I'm here to give something to whoever is here. Maybe it's even that I tell a funny story in my speech, and maybe someone in the crowd really had a rough week. And maybe that speech evening, the, that club evening, lifts them up a little bit, gives them a little encouragement, and helps them to forget about some of the things that they have been going through. I mean, whatever we can do to get our minds off ourselves and on the task at hand, that's having a more complete love, isn't it? Because that's the way God thinks. And when we do that, we're less apt to make mistakes and then fall apart when we make mistakes or get corrected. So having a growth-oriented mindset builds resilience in us because we're not crushed when we make mistakes or are corrected. Number three, perfectionism is critical and demanding of others. A growth mindset can overlook mistakes with patience. Number three, perfectionism is critical and demanding of others, but a growth mindset can overlook mistakes of others with patience. Sometimes we can think, well, I expect a lot of myself, and so that's why I expect a lot, of other, uh, a lot from others. And we can use that as an excuse to be demanding and critical and insulting of others and demeaning. And, and, and that's not what God is after. You know, as parents, it's, it's difficult to get the right balance 
of expecting obedience and yet, yet not being overly critical, but we have to strive for that. We have to strive for not being perfectionist parents that are driving their children to perform and they make a mistake and we have disdain or ridicule for them. Certainly, if, if they act inappropriately, if they uh, lie, if they're rebellious, it needs to be dealt with based on the infraction. But that's different than insulting them, mocking them, holding them in disdain. You know, when children are learning to walk, if a baby is crawling and then getting up and taking a few steps, uh, what do we as parents do? We watch them and our faces glow, right? Watch parents when their children take a first few steps. It's amazing. They're so excited. And they reach out their arms. Go, you can do it. And that little toddler is, ah. And then what happens? They fall down. Boom. And they might cry a little bit and a few tears. Or they might just look a little shocked. Now imagine the same scene if after that toddler takes three steps, and falls down, imagine if the parents would look at that children, child like, oh, can't believe you fell down. I am so embarrassed. After all, Susie took five steps the first time she walked, and you can only take three, and they're angry, their, their countenance falls, and they walk away, you know, abandon that. I, I can't believe it. I can't even be here. Is that what any parent would do? Of course not. And imagine what that child, the signals that child would get if the parent did that. It'd be horrible, wouldn't it? Because we know they're learning to walk, and we know that learning to walk means they're going to stumble and fall, and they have to get up again, and we can understand that. But why is it that sometimes as they get older and they grow in a different way, maybe they're preteens or teens or young adults, and maybe they do something that is embarrassing to us? Why is it that we sometimes have very different feelings and, and emotions than when they're trying to learn and take a few steps as a toddler. You know, the point is not to focus on our embarrassment and not lose it just because we're embarrassed, but focus on the issue. Maybe there is something that needs to be corrected. But they're learning, just like that toddler is learning to walk. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, notice 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Again, none of this is to imply that we shouldn't deal with problems, shouldn't deal with issues, shouldn't handle misbehavior. But what is our attitude? And how are we thinking and how are we expressing it? Sure, we're going to be upset sometimes. But are we reassuring them? Are we showing them that we are actually trying to help them to grow, to be different? and be mature, and we're showing them how to be an adult by our own actions? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, Though I uh, speak with t the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Uh, drop down to verse 4, Love suffers long, love is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, it does not behave rudely, does not be, seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. You know, sometimes when we get in a perfectionist attitude, we're going to do all the op opposite of these things in dealing with other people, aren't we? But if we're in a growth-oriented mindset, we're going to understand they're growing just like me. Whether it's our children or whether it's someone else. Verse 11. Uh, verse 9. 
uh, for we know in part, we prophesy in part, but that when that when that which is perfect has come, same word, teleos, same word that we read in Matthew 5 and other places, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Where are we going? We are striving to grow up, aren't we? We're striving to become mature. And we can help as parents, going back to that example, as parents, we can help our children learn how to navigate through a world that is increasingly negative. And a world where young people are increasingly struggling with pressures of perfectionism because of the world that we live in today. Again, I, I was a bit of a perfectionist as a kid, and I, I beat myself up a lot about growth and overcoming and perfection, and, and I talked to my dad a lot. And I just recently came across a paper where I, in July of 1991, I typed out some of the things that he had told me in our conversations that I remembered. And I, I, I just found it in a folder just a few days ago. And, you know, it brought back a lot of memories and a lot of conversations that I had with him. And how thankful I was that he helped me to have the tools to navigate through a difficult time when I was 22. And I was trying to struggle with who I am and, and where is my place in this world and what does it mean to grow and, and become mature and to overcome, and spiritually especially. And the things that he said helped me a lot. Don't underestimate your ability, parents, to help your children navigate the challenges they face. And not just saying, stop being a perfectionist but rather sitting down and talking to them and listening to them and walking through it with them and coming up with solutions with them, finding out what's on their mind and helping them figure out their life. What's, what is more important of an investment in time than helping our children understand how to face the world? So growth orientation helps us be patient when others make mistakes instead of being quick to condemn or ridicule. Let's look at one more. That is, number four, perfectionism has a distorted view of the Christian walk, but a growth-oriented mindset has a balanced and healthy view of the Christian walk. Let's turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse... 16. Paul writes, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, you know, how do you live a balanced and healthy life? Well, you grow. You, every day as you're making a decision every day to follow either the, the pulls of the flesh or the prompting of God's Spirit. And if we follow the lead of the Spirit, then that's one millimeter of growth in that tree or that barley sprout. One millimeter of growth. It doesn't look like much. But you stack them up over a year or two or five or ten, and that's real growth. Going on, verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revels, revelries, and the like of which I tell you before, just as I also told you in times past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, if, if we are looking at our life 
And if we're finding the fruit is like this, then we need to reevaluate the path we're going down. But we can see it from the fruit. We can see the path we're on from the fruit on the tree, right? Something needs to change. It's not going the right direction. On the other hand, verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So, brethren, what fruit do we have in our life? Do we have a sense of these things happening? Again, not perfectly. We're never going to be perfect in, in the sinless uh, thought and, and um, frame of mind or even the, the maturity frame of mind, until we are changed into spirit. But we're growing that direction. We're attempting to gain uh, progress down there. You know, if we don't see some of the fruits that we want, then we need to get on our knees and ask God for help. We need to ask him for a particular, if, if we, we don't see some fruit in our life, we need to ask him for it. Not to perform, but to say, I, I want more of this. Please help me. We look into his word, we read the passages about what we're lacking, and, and we grow. Sometimes uh, fruit is not real evident. Sometimes we're in deep trials. Sometimes we're struggling. Sometimes we have really difficult things happening in our life. And we can feel like, well, I'm not growing. I don't see a lot of those fruits in my life. And maybe we don't have a lot of joy at that moment. Maybe we don't have a lot of peace at that moment. But maybe God is teaching us long-suffering at that moment. Maybe that's the fruit of that moment. Maybe faithfulness at that moment of, of suffering. Maybe there is fruit, we just don't see it because we're only looking at the first three and not the last three. What is God developing in your life? Maybe there's fruit on the tree, but we're so fixated on perfectionism, we miss it. You know, I have a, I have a, a plum tree that I love. It, it's just a wonderful plum tree. Uh, the, the fruits are not the tart red kind of plums, but they are the orange, reddish, uh, and they're so sweet. They're just wonderful. And um, so in the early spring, I, I go out there and I, I look at that tree, and, and it's hard to see the fruits early on because they're green, just like the leaves, and it's like they hide behind the leaves. And so at first, when you just walk by, you think, oh, there's no fruit on this tree. But then... When I start digging, I kind of pull some branches apart, and I look a little bit close. Ah, oh, there's one. And as soon as I see it, I can remember what it tastes like, and I'm looking forward to three months down the road when it comes to fruition. I know exactly what it's going to taste like. You know, sometimes we might be blinded so much by perfectionism that we don't see the things that are right there that God is doing in our life. And would be encouraging if we would, we would focus on. We need to be thankful for what God is doing as we ask him for help for more. So are you a perfectionist? Even if you are, don't be discouraged. Maybe you just need a different model of thinking about perfection. And that is growth. Let's turn over to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. God doesn't keep a permanent record of our mistakes. When we repent, he removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. His eyes are on the end goal, the finish line, and our, not eyes, our eyes need to be on that goal as well. 1 John 3 and verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. We are in embryo stage. We are only begotten. 
we are, okay, maybe we're not 99.44% carnal. Maybe we've really grown a lot in the last three decades that we've been baptized. And now we're down to 91% carnal, you know, or maybe 85% carnal, whatever. How do you measure that? I don't know. But maybe we're making progress and... We're looking more and more as that embryo grows like our father. As an embryo in a fetus looks more and more like its human father and mother. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it does, has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. This is growth. This is where we look for, for how to progress and develop. Not perfectionism. We purify ourselves because we can see through a glass darkly where we're going. And that someday we're going to look in the eyes of our father and our elder brother face to face. And we'll be like him in totality. Yes, shining like the sun in glory, but also in character. And we're in the process of doing that now, little by little. Let's turn over to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3. Philippians Chapter 1, verse 3. Perfectionism is a trap that hinders us from really making progress on our path of, of spiritual development. We need to focus on growth. We need to look forward to the day when we see God and we're like him. An amazing, amazing thought, amazing concept. Amazing vision of the future and that God is giving to us. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3. This is one more example, a place where the word teleo is also used. And we'll see it here in a moment. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing. Brethren, we can have confidence. We don't have to wonder. If we're walking with God, if we're living this way of life, if we're obeying his commandments and we're responding to his spirit, we can have confidence. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. That's the same root verb as perfection. Because perfection means completeness. Until the day of Jesus Christ. Brethren, that's how we become perfect. Not through perfectionism, not through something that we've imagined in our mind or projected to what we think God wants us to do and to be, but this is how we become perfect. When we enter the kingdom and family of God at the resurrection, that's perfection, that's completion. <laughs> 